Dr. Saw asked me to um, give this talk, which is um, kind of could be big or little, but it gave me the opportunity to look back um, about SCAD across the ages because you're going to hear so much today about SCAD in the current. So um, I have no disclosures. So you may have seen this. I know that Dr. Saw has presented this as, quote, the first reported case of SCAD. But she makes the point that this probably, based on reading through, this was actually an aortic dissection, but that it did extend into the coronary arteries. So I'm not sure that I would agree with this being the first, uh, the first one, but it goes back to 1931. There's nothing really before that. So we do know that um, SCAD can be bad, and really that was what everyone thought if they were thinking about SCAD prior to the past 10 years. So if you look back, and I'm not going to give you a full review of the, the literature, SCAD was described as rare or even extremely rare. There were a lot of case reports, so one case at a time, and a lot of autopsy reports, um, which if you were a SCAD patient and Googling the literature, that was not a very reassuring thing. In fact, there were reports of a 30 to 80% fatality rate. In fact, it was reportable, like you could get it published if you had a patient who survived SCAD. Lots of things were described that didn't really fit in the SCAD bucket that we now do, like they were hit in the chest with a, you know, a steering wheel, or, and it was believed that it was about 70% women, which we now know is probably much more frequent women, probably because um, they were mixing in atherosclerosis. So again, these were not very good um, good studies, at least how we are doing it today. We flash forward to the 80s, and actually these would when they become relevant, and I am not saying that I look at every single paper, I can't say this was actually, but this was um, the first case of, of recurrent scan. Because many people were told it will never, it's like a lightning strike, it'll never happen again. And in that same patient, they noticed that his prior scan had healed. So it was sort of, they, they claimed it was the first reported case of healed scan. And then the first case, which is still something we're questioning, is SCAD that was associated with coronary basal spasm. And then in 1986, there was a world review of the literature. This was 72 cases, which was a, a lot of cases put together. At that time, though it probably doesn't entirely represent the, the population that we see, and that 84% were women. Um, the mean age is very similar to what we uh, report now, but, and with the range, it was most commonly in the left anterior sitting artery. Um, less than a third of those patients in that group survived in the first 24 hours. And there's a quote that emergency bypass and lytic therapy have not been successful, which may um, Then in the 1980s, again, some, some of the literature, the first time that people were really talking about this problem possibly be related to the vasovisorum. So for those uh, patients, the vasovisorum are the blood vessels around arteries that actually give the artery the blood, the blood supply. So if they bleed or rupture or somehow dysfunctional, there's a thought that that might contribute to scattering. We're still talking about that today. And in 1989, they actually um, had a, a case that less than 20 surviving patients and there are more than 20 of you in this room. So we know that that, that was, uh, again, it was a very, very, because this was viewed, and it's like being in the room um, of five blind men feeling an elephant and, the, and describing what they see. So everyone was looking at SCAD through a very narrow lens and coming up with things that maybe you know, may not be, and in fact aren't representative today. 1994, this was the first reported case that at least I could find of reporting exercise as a trigger. Um, I love that she's described as a housewife. Um, <laughs> um, she had an unusually severe exercise at the gymnasium. And then we move forward, and in 1998, a report of an emotional trigger uh, of SCAD. And then through the next 10 years or so, there were just lots of reports, one report that people would grab onto. So they would, and some of which we're still really interested in, others have sort of fallen by the wayside because it was just probably a person with that condition who had a scat. I mean, and some of these conditions are very, very common. 
Um, there were many proposed best treatments, including some that we specifically advise against these days. And, um, and the, the literature still was troublesome because it included, when they, were, when they were describing deceptions, they were often including not just spontaneous coronary deceptions, but deceptions during uh, a percutaneous intervention, during a catalase. They were reporting patients who had had chest trauma. They were reporting individuals who had dissection as a result of a big plaque, and the plaque rupture had caused the dissection. So then what changed since 2010? So I've given you a history of where we were. It was this fuzzy water, and a lot of folks in this room um, were starting to see SCAD differently and starting to explore SCAD differently. Some of that had to do with really a jumpstart in patient advocacy, where patients said, like, particularly Catherine Leon, who is going to be one of our faculty today, who, who sort of said, this doesn't make sense. Like, my experience doesn't fit with all of that stuff in the literature that I read. There, you know, let's see what else there might be. When collaborators start talking to each other, like when Dr. Saw and I compare notes sometimes and say, are you seeing this, are you seeing this? It can be really helpful and uh, validating because sometimes when you observe something and it doesn't fit with anything else that has been reported before, you can doubt yourself. So I think that has been really helpful in jumpstarting this. Obviously, by getting more um, groups of patients, these bigger um, uh, SCAD registries that we've got, um, allows us to see, you know what, there really isn't a signal. That does not appear to be really associated. It was just a case report of one woman who had this unusual disease, and we haven't seen it again, versus, well, I'm seeing a pattern now, like migraine headaches or fibromuscular dysplasia. So we recognize that we still got some work to do in, in this space, but I think that that's really when it was doctors and researchers talking together and the urging of patients like you in the room really made this go forward. I think what really brought a lot of us together in this room, and I've uh, bolded those who are your speakers for this, as you can see, is being able to have a consensus statement um, about SCAD. Um, we talked about this a bit last year, and I will just say that for those of you who don't know about consensus statements or guideline statements, um, until you've got something, each paper that comes out, even when the science is great, oh yeah, that's just Mayo Clinic, oh, that's just Vancouver General, let's see what the experts coming together might say. And so this allowed us to come together. And I will tell you that there are many parts of this where there was some agreeing to disagree, either because we didn't have enough data, or we, we all were thinking that there were other ways to do this because we did not have enough evidence. But we are hoping, I think many of those researchers here in this room are hoping that we'll not just have a scientific statement, which is a consensus statement, but at some point we will be able to have enough evidence to reach the bar to actually have a guideline statement, which will really guide the people caring for patients with SCAD uh, going forward. So this is just some of the highlights, and these are really highlights because there are talks about each of these. But one is coming to a common definition of SCAD. It's spontaneous, that's the S. It's non-traumatic, we're not including people who have a, you know, are hit by a car and have a, a steering wheel injury. And not iatrogenic, not caused by doctors. The average age has sort of been defined. It's more like 90% women, at least in the registries. I do think that we're probably missing some um, middle-aged men and calling them atherosclerosis who have SCAD because we're not expecting SCAD in men. Um, the uh, frequency of this being in postpartum or peripartum women has actually gone down compared to 15 years ago. That's probably because we are diagnosing more in women who are not. So it's more of a math issue as opposed to really a change. Uh, we know that individuals don't typically have much in the way of risk factors, and that familial SCAD can occur. It's very rare. The other thing is, it's not nearly as rare, and it's certainly not extremely rare. Um, we were missing a lot of it, but as will be alluded by several talks on how we can better diagnose it. And uh, Dr. Mulvey already shared some of these demographics about SCAD. What we've also learned is what I was taught in cardiology school, which was to look for a flap on the angiogram, was largely wrong because about 80% have more of a bruise within the line or an intramural hematoma. 
And so that's one of the reasons I get asked all the time, and I don't have an exact answer, is why are we hearing so much more about SCAD? Why are we, um, why is it being diagnosed more? Is it more common, or are we just better at diagnosing it? Well, I know that second part about being better at diagnosing it is definitely true. Whether there's been an increased frequency in SCAD over the past couple of decades, I think we don't know that answer yet. Because frankly, we don't know how many were happening 15 years ago. It's not benign, because many patients back then, you know, you had people that were being told it was 80% fatal, and then you also hope to, if you survive it, you'll be fine, never happen again, right? So we know that that's not true. Unfortunately, there are recurrences of SCAD that we have to pay attention to. And I think the thing that you will hear throughout the conference, um, and one of the things that Dr. Saw has certainly been a leader in, is recognizing that it's not just the physical. Yes, people can have big heart attacks, and, and we have to deal with a lot of cardiac things, but there are many other burdens experienced by patients after SCAD, um, mental health, PTSD, lots of chest pain that's sort of unexplained. And so that's very different from the patient who comes in with a STEMI and we stent it and give them five medications that will prevent their next one. And so it's a different patient population. And obviously, because we've got lots of times, different associated factors. So this is just a, a graphic, I've showed, shared this before, but it's kind of how I think about some of the things that contribute to SCAD. So there's some underlying conditions, um, and the sizes of these bubbles are not representative, but we know they're associated with pregnancy and hormonal things, fibromuscular dysplasia is a big thing. Very rarely is there a medical genetics actual, um, like Ehlers-Danlos. And then there's some other associated factors that are still in kind of that question mark. So we think about this as a condition and then maybe a trigger or a perfect storm. Um, not every scat is like that. I mean, many patients that I have say it was a normal day, nothing going on, I didn't exert myself, I had no, you know, I was happy and it was a normal day. But we are seeing patterns that look like this. I'm not going to go through this, but obviously it's a slide to say that we need to be thinking about treating scat differently. Because when we go in, like we were told we were supposed to with the STEMI and muck around with catheters, we realized and recognized that the outcomes after SCAD were not nearly as effective. We were more likely to cause harm or just be unsuccessful. And couple that with, if left alone, many SCAD arteries heal completely. So you put those two together and it makes us have to think about SCAD in a different way. We found that there are some telltale signs, sometimes on the angiogram. On average, patients with SCAD have more curly Q or tortuous coronary arteries compared to the normal population. We don't know exactly what this means. It may be that this is um, coronary fibromuscular dysplasia or other factors. We'll hear a lot about this, and we've got some experts in the room, but. Um, fibromuscular dysplasia, or other types of arteriopathies have been very much associated with SCAD. So instead of thinking of SCAD as we did 15 years ago, that this was an isolated cardiac issue or coronary artery issue, when we screen patients, most have some other abnormality in their arteries, section and aneurysm, or just tortuosity um, uh, or fibromuscular dysplasia, meaning that this is something that may make other arteries in the body um, more vulnerable. The reason SCAD is sort of that canary in the cold lump line is that the heart can't go uh, you know, seconds without a blood supply. So it's gonna be the one that if you interrupt the blood supply, it will, it will tell us. We're learning more about the genetics. So the bad news is there isn't a SCAD gene. I mean, in some ways that's good news, bad news. But it also means that there's not going to be a genetic test that will allow us to say, you have the SCAD gene. And I have many patients who talk to me about, I'm really worried about my particularly adult daughters. Uh, you know, she just got married, she's thinking about pregnancy, I would want to have SCAD. So there's not a genetic test that we can do. But because now that we have this research, and we have literally thousands of patients who have given up their DNA, we are able now to do more sophisticated types of genetic studies where we may be able to find associations and multiple genes that may impact this. And that's more of a, a, a bit of a future watch. 
So I'd like to sort of round this off uh, by talking about what I think, because I got to be the second speaker today, so I can talk about what I think we all should be talking about in terms uh, of, uh, of SCAD, is better understanding more research on chest pain after SCAD. Because it isn't the same as chest pain after an atherosclerotic heart attack. That we really address the psychosocial and mental health issues in patients with SCAD, which are different. We need to make sure that, particularly in the US, I know this is not a Canadian issue, but in the US, many women and men who have SCAD do not have access to cardiac rehabilitation, either because of cost or lack of referral. The big question about physical activity after SCAD, if we know that exercise can be a trigger, um, what's safe? In general, people are given very conservative um, uh, and uniform, I call them dumb recommendations, because um, we give the same recommendations to all patients with SCAD because we don't have a way that we can risk stratify. So I have many patients who may be able to fully, safely go out to a marathon and others who really shouldn't be running up the stairs. And so what we do is we kind of tell everybody pretty conservative. Same with pregnancy, for that matter. Um, we know that some pregnancy is a risk around the time of SCAD, so we tell most people we prefer that they have a pregnancy. There may be people who after SCAD could have a completely low-risk pregnancy and others who we definitely, and we don't know that yet. So I think better risk stratifying. Um, again, the, the pregnancy issues so that we can better inform uh, women better understanding the genetic underpinnings, and better understanding recurrent SCAD. So if we've got this recurrence rate over 10 years of 20% plus, are there things that we can risk stratify? So we can reassure some individuals that we, we're not really worried about them because they're low risk, versus being more attentive to and careful with higher risk individuals. Again, right now we don't have the risk stratification, nor have we um, identified anything that's proven in a clinical trial that can prevent recurrent SCAD, um, uh, although we do have beta blockers that have been associated uh, with a lower risk. So that is sort of the brief history of where we were, and many of you in the room were born at the beginning of the slide. I wasn't, so I'm assuming that not many uh, others are you. And kind of very high level where we've come to and what we in this room really need to drive forward. So I don't know if I have time for a question or, okay. 